shit, shit, shit. Sorry. I left it on. And I, I had to go to the bathroom real quick before I came on. Sorry about that. Hope you weren't waiting for too long. Um, I'll just double check. Okay, it sounded like... Okay. Shit, shit, sorry. I left it on. I hear myself now. Okay. Yeah, sounds like it loops. So it'll play the intro over again next time that may occur. Gotta keep that in mind. Sorry about the appearance. I'm totally in my upstate coronavirus gear. So, yeah. This isn't really a look that is the normal for me uh, publicly, but this is the normal me not publicly. So, you know, coronavirus, whatever, it's happening. We're. Where everyone's dealing with this right now, so I don't have any clothes. I don't even have earrings to put on if I want to look cute. So, um, anyway, today, what are we going over? Oh, shoot, I have to restart my goal actually. Eh, that goal expired. Let me do that real quick. My bad, so not prepared. Um, stream labs. Let's go to this. Let's go to this goal. End goal. Okay, let's do, what is the week? It's Wednesday. Um, shit, should've done this. Ah, ah, calendar, calendar. Okay, April 5th to the 11th. April 5th to the 11th. April 5th to 11th, that's what we're supposed to do. Let's see if I can make a few hundred bucks this week. Month. Uh, 12, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Goal is refreshed. Boom. Ooh, goal's refreshed. I have this really cool like light actually with me too. And I wanted to like point it like at me, but the shit is like, I don't think it's meant to be pointing at you. It's like really intense. Um, so I was trying to give it like some cool side light, like a blue side light, but I don't know. I don't exactly know what to do with it. Anyway, uh, how are you guys doing? We're going to go over Greek art today. So we'll pick up in the art history book where we left out. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go to our split screen. Hold on a second. Window capture. Um, there we go. And I think some people like um, Rainbow or something asked to make this bigger. Let me see if I can do that for you. Um, Because I think it's hard to read for people that are possibly on a, another screen, like a small screen. But I'll try. This is the best I got. I'll have to keep in mind what you guys can see on the page and what you can't. How's that look? Okay, so we left off with these uh, Greek vases and stuff, uh, and how they had the different styles. There was this style where they uh, painted with black, and this is um, Ajax playing like chess or some sort of oh, dice game with Achilles. Achilles? Um, and then there's this technique where they did the opposite. They actually used the black um, in the negative space and used the um, more red brown tones on the skin tone. And this was uh, Hercules wrestling um, and Teos. Yeah. Um, so there was that, which reminds me, um, reminded me when I was cleaning my mother's basement, I came across some really old stuff, like things from like 1992. Um, but in probably the late 90s, there was um, something from school, 
maybe 2000, um, I came across something that we did in school and it reminded me when we were talking about all this. So good thing this is where we were leaving off because oh, let me find it. But I wanted to show you guys something. I'm such a boomer with technology. I'm trying. Okay. Cool. This is <laughs> so embarrassing, but it's cute. It's cute. This is something that I made in like late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, I found that in my mom's basement. So this was some like total lady alchemy uh, kind of Greek sculpture thing. How funny is that? So funny, so cute. It's a little bit of some, some Martina making, trying to make those Greek sculpture aesthetics. I mean, sculpture, Greek vase aesthetics. Very Lady Alchemy. We got demons in there. And a beautiful lady. Oh, that's Pandora's box. Oh, I was obsessed with Pandora back then. Actually, on AIM, uh, AOL Instant Messenger, before all these social medias, this is what we used to do in the 90s, was talk to each other on AIM. And my screen name was Pandora's Box 832. And people used to always ask me, because, you know, we were kids, why was that, what's Pandora's box? And I would explain to them the um, uh, mythology of Pandora's box and opening out these demons that she let out. So those are like demons. And, uh, but she didn't let out this demon that would take away hope. And without hope, it, how you know how do you live and stuff like that so yeah I loved Pandora's box so I was doing Pandora's box nice nice yeah those are the demons cool <laughs> why why Jay I know I'm old all right let's get back to the proper art that was just a cute little aside shall we um Oh, okay, sorry. I have a lot that I need to do. This is so bad. I'm adjusting this. I don't know if you guys can read this, but I'm gonna have that shit on the screen. That should look better. Ravenzo is saying that my link for Streamlabs is hard to read. Um, so I made it a little bit bigger. Hopefully you guys can read it. It's streamlabs.com slash TV. And if you're watching this right now on DLive, that means you're watching this live live, like live right now. Um, so if you do help me out with Streamlabs, which is preferred, um, you won't really see this move until like next DLive stream. And then you'll like your um, contribution will be shown to the goal. So don't worry about it if it doesn't pop up right away. I'll still address your um, super chat and um, we'll, you'll see that grow over the week and thanks to you. Um, but if you're watching this on YouTube, sorry, I should mention this earlier. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're watching a YouTube premiere. So it's not the live live, but I'm probably in the chats with you chatting away. Probably told you a million times by now that it's not live live, but um, I depend more on YouTube for um, making money because I don't make shit on DLive, okay? <laughs> I make like two bucks. So um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can still help me out with the super chats. That'll be awesome. Thank you. Anyway, um, okay, so where were we? We were looking at this Etruscan stuff. I don't think we saw this vase yet. Let me see, let me see. Red figure painting, yeah, we saw this. Um, Euphrono, Euphronos? Euphronos, I'm gonna look that up just to make sure I know how to say that, Euphronos. Mm, how to pronounce. Mm. 
Euphronius. 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 Okay, Euphronius. Euphronius. One of the most admired red figure painter painters was Euphronius, whose crater depicting the struggle between Hercules. Oh, we already read that. Euphronius. We already read that. We didn't see this one though. Let's see, 226. Yeah, okay, it's here. This one. Euthymides. 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 Okay, euthymides. Uh, okay, euthymides. Yeah, euthymides. A preoccupation with the art of drawing per se is evident in a remarkable amphora. This one right here above. Let me make sure you guys can see it. Cool. This amphora over here, painted by euthymides, one of Euphronios' rival. So one of the rivals of this guy. I did that one. Okay, we got art rivals happening. Love it. I'm into that. Art rivals. Euphronios. Okay, the subject is appropriate for a wine storage jar. Three tipsy revelers. Cool. But the theme was little more than an excuse for the artists to experiment with representing unusual positions of the human form. Ooh, something exciting happened. What was that? What happened? Oh, okay, we got, um... Fuck Google too, get you five bucks. And he says, AOL, did you do Windows uh, front page, Barf? <laughs> yeah, those were the days, man. Those were the days. Um, okay, so yeah, they wanted to experiment with the human form doing weird shapes. It is no coincidence that the bodies do not overlap for each is in an independent figure study. Oh, I love that. It is quite beautiful. Um, Euphemides cast aside the conventional frontal and profile composite views. Instead, he painted torsos that are uh, not two-dimensional surface patterns, but are foreshortened, that is, drawn in three-quarter view. That's true. Most noteworthy is the central figure, which Euphemides depicted from the rear with a twisting spinal column and buttocks in a three-quarter view. Ooh, that three-quarter buttocks view makes for a nice little hump, you know what I mean? Yeah, that three-quarter butt shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's probably gay, knew what he was doing there. Um, mm -mm. Most noteworthy is the central figure with the three-quarter buttocks shot. Earlier artists had no interest in attempting such uh, postures because they did not only um, because not only are excuse me because not only are they incomplete where am I I lost it okay yeah so not only are they incomplete but also do not show the main side of the human body for euthymides however the challenge of drawing the figure from such an unusual viewpoint was a reward in itself. With understandable pride, he proclaimed his achievement by adding to the formulaic signature, Euthymides painted me, the phrase as never Euth Euphronius could do. Um, oh, damn. They were tagging their shit like, bitch, I painted this. Not that other dude. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. We have a few um, diamonds. Love it. Thank you. Thank you for the diamonds. Um, 
That's great. You know what would be really cool? Maybe a ninja guinea or a ninja jet? Um, yo, hom homosexuality check. Cool, cool. And we got some ice cream. Cool, cool. Okay. Okay, that was pretty cool. Ah, thank you, fuck Google, too. Okay, then we have the Temple of Afai. Agina? Agina? Let's, let's see how we say this stuff. Shall we? Um, how to pronounce? Afaya. 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 Okay. Afaya, and I want to see this one. Egina, Greece. Egina? <laughs> okay. I think I'm gonna go with a fire. A fire. A fire, then. Egina. 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 That sounds terrible. That's a terrible name. I'd rather take a fire than Egina. The years just before and after 500 BCE were a time of dynamic transition, also in architecture and architectural sculpture. The key monument is the temple figure 227, dedicated to Aphaya, a local goddess at Egina. Okay, so I guess there are not two names for it. It's the location of where Aphaya is. Um, the colonnade is 45 by 50, 95 feet and consists of six Doric columns on the facade and 12 on the flanks. Remember last time we uh, did discuss some of the different kind of columns, the, column, the Doric columns and the, what is it, Io, Ioic or something, Ionic? Yeah. Um, mm, mm, mm. This structure is much more compact than the impressive but ungainly archaic temple of Hera at um, Pastum. Okay, so this is a model, um, and the right uh, and is the plan of the Temple of Aphaya in Aegina, Greece, circa 500 to 490 BCE. Model in Munich somewhere. Um, in this refined Doric design, the columns are more slender and widely spaced. There are only six columns on the facade, and the cella has two colonnades of two stories each, framing the cult statue. I love it. I'm really into that. Damn. Okay, so... Even though the ratio of width to length similar, uh, is similar, Doric architects had learned a great deal in the half century that elapsed between construction of the two temples. The columns of uh, Aegina temple are more widely spaced and more slender. The capitals create a smooth transition from vertical shafts below the horizontal arcade uh, Architrave, 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 above. None are the archaic flattened. Mm. What the fuck is that? That looks like a porcupine. What the fuck? The kindness. The kindness. A sea urchin? <coughs> okay, architecture. A convex molding just below the abacus of a Doric capital. Oh, hi. Dutch accent. Okay, architecture. 
Okay, let's bring this baby up for a second. Let's just look at what they're talking about and not skip past anything. Um, this is what I'm looking at. So we have... Um, I hate this thing. Okay, that's the abacus that, okay, and then there's the echinus. Okay, like, you know, what's that like? Molding. I would call it a molding. Yeah, it's a type of molding, I guess. It's really cool. There's like the basic all the way on that end. Uh, the abacus. The ab abac. And then there's the Egyptian ones, the Indian ones, the Doric Greek. That's what we've been looking at. And there's Doric Roman, Corinthian, Marquis, Byzantine, Roman ones, Gothic. Nice. Gothic polygonal. Oh. Oh, I don't think you guys can see all these. Hold up. And then the Renaissance one. Cool. I'm into it. How are you guys doing? You alright? Don't see much commotion going on. I hope YouTube gets better. Hmm. All right. Fine then. Okay, so gone are the archaic flattening of that like top one, the kind of nicest, and the bulging shafts of the pest pestum columns. The Agina architect also refined the temple plan and internal elevation. In place of a single row of columns down the cella center is a double colonnade, and each row has two stories. This arrangement allowed for the placement of a statue in the, on the central axis and also gave those gathered in front of the building an unobstructed view through the pair um, of columns in the pranea, praneus. So that's really cool. So none of the columns obstructed the view of the sculpture. They're a cult deity, and it gave it like this really epic view. Cool, cool. Painted half-size statuary filled both of the Aegina's, Aegina temple's pediments. Figure 228. Okay, so and now they're talking about this picture over here. 228, let's see. Painted half-size statuary filled the Jaina temple's pediments. The two statuary groups depicting the same subject had similar composition. The theme was the battle of Greeks and Trojans with Athena at the center. Oh, cool. Okay, I see it, I see it. Let me see if I'm zooming all. I think this is what they're talking about. This battle between Trojans with Athena in the middle. Restored facade of the temple of Aphia, uh, Aegina, Greece, circa 550 to 490 BCE. Um, the Aegina sculptors solved the problem of placing figures in pediment by using the whole range of postures from upright to leaning, falling, kneeling, and lying. Only Athena is larger than the rest. Okay, so yeah, last time they were talking about that, like, area. What do they call it? Um, the pediment. So, like, that triangle bit at the top. 
they were talking about how it was difficult to make like stories make sense in there because they tend to like get really cramped on the side so they would use like animals or things that would like fit in there and they would put things that didn't really make sense but just like try to fit them in there because like they had that space but this one I guess like used this like storytelling and was able to make them crawling and leaning and have different postures and then Athena like the the, the center most like tallest thing in it it looks beautiful I like it um let's see yeah two statuary group two statuary groups depicted the same subject had uh and had similar positions the theme was the battle of greeks and trojans with athena at the center she is larger okay yeah, i already read that sorry the sculptures of the west pediment were set in uh, place upon completion of the building around 490 BCE. The Eastern statues are a decade or two later in date. Comparison of the earlier and later figures is uh, instructive. The sculptor of the West Pediment's dying uh, warrior, figure 229, this one up top, okay, so this guy's figure, uh, still conceived uh, the figure in the archaic mode. The torso is rigidly frontal and the warrior uh, looks out directly at the spectator and smiles. In spite of the bronze arrow... Okay, so he's looking out at the audience and smiling in spite of the bronze arrow that punctures his chest. He is like a mannequin in a store window whose arms and legs have been arranged by someone else for effective display. The comparable figure in 230... Uh, right here in the later east pediment is ra radically different. Not only is his posture more uh, natural and more complex with the torso placed at an angle to the viewer, he is on par with the painting's figure of Euphronios, but he also reacts to his wound. He knows death is inevitable, but he still struggles to rise once again, using his shield for support, and he does not look out at the viewer. He's concerned with his plan, nothing else. The two statues belong to different eras. The later warrior is not a creation of the archaic world, and sculptors imposed anatomical patterns and smiles on statues from without. It belongs to the classical world where statues move as humans move and possess the self-consciousness of real men and women. This was a radical change in the connection of what a statue should be. In sculpture, as in painting, the classical revolution had occurred. Damn, that's so dramatic. So dramatic, man. How are you guys doing? Um, all right. Not a lot of commotion going on. We've got 18 viewers. Um, yeah, you guys hear birds. There's birds here. Um, I guess I will keep going. Let me see. Where am I at? we got 40 minutes in. All right. <clears throat> uh, Stephen Forex, I wonder if that's the etymology of pedestal, perhaps. Yeah. J. Will's impressive how they made these. Yeah, relief. Well, no, I guess that's not relief. These are just sculpture sculptures. I just can't believe how big they are, really. Because you see them up here as decoration, and it's like, whoa. They're, like, pretty big, actually. Yeah, because, uh, again, they give you this little marker here, always with the sculptures. And so him laying down like that is one foot right here uh, by his... Sh just above his shoulder, by his neck, he's like one foot, and he's lying down, so, it's pretty big. Yeah, I know, I always think of these things as relief, but they're not, they're like actual sculptures, but I always envision this like the old ones that we went over, the ancient ones, and I always think that they're relief, but they're just like sculptures placed into this like area. Alright, let's 
see what's happening in here. Uh, I, I like to read all the little bits on these guys. Okay, so the dying warrior from the west pediment of the temple of Athea in Aegina, Greece, circa 500 to 490 BCE. It's made out of marble. <gasps> oh, I love marble. And it's five feet, two and a half inches long. And it's in Munich. The two sets of Aegina pediment statues were installed 10 to 20 years apart. The earlier statues exhibit archaic features. This fallen warrior still has a rigidly frontal torso and an archaic smile. This looks like a theater, like, dance. He's like, hey. And then we have this guy. Dying warrior from the east pediment of the temple of Athia, Aegina, Greece, circa 492, 480 BCE. Marble, it's six foot and one inch long. Damn, this guy is huge. This later dying warrior already belongs to the classical era. Uh, era. His posture is more natural and he exhibits a new self consciousness. Concerned with his own pain, he does not face the viewer. I love it. Still kind of looks like he's smiling, but okay, I guess it's a struggle. I see it, I see it. Yeah, that one looks way cooler. I mean, how degenerate though. I got the balls hanging out. Like, come on. Dangling balls. Art. Can you believe that? Okay, so early, um, it's just vibing, bro. Okay, so early in high classical art. Ooh, I wish I got to label my video about that. Damn. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a tweet about it. To it. How you guys doing? He's just vibing. Okay, cool. So early and high classical art. Art historians mark the beginning of the classical age from a historical event. Uh, okay, let's read this again. Art historians mark the beginning of the classical age from a historical event. Event. The defeat of the Persian invaders of Greece by the allied Hellenistic city-states. Shortly after the sack of Athens in 480 BCE, the Greeks won uh, a decisive naval victory over the Persians at Sal Salamis. It had been a difficult war and it had seemed at times as though Asia would swallow up Greece and the Persian king Xerxes would rule over all. The sense of Hellenistic identity became so strong after that close escape from domination by Asian barbarians that thereafter the civilizations of Europe and Asia took distinctly separate paths. Historians universally consider the decades following the defeat of the Persians as the high point of Greek civilization. This is the era of the dramaticists. Um, uh, I don't know how to say that name. Sophocles and Euph Euphrates, the, um, no, Eur Eur Euripides, 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 Euphrates is a river, Euripides, oh, I guess I gotta look up how to say his names, ah. how do I pronounce it? East Coast. What? East Coast. East Coast? That looks nothing like that. That's insane. 
Iskus. Is Iskus. Iskus. I'm gonna pff. Sophocles, and let's see this one. Euripides. 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 Okay. Um, okay, this era of the these dramaticists, the historian, Herod, okay, whatever, and the statesman, the statesman, uh, Persicle? Pericles, Pericles. Oh my god, people are probably going to be like, well, fuck, bitch, I don't know what that is, sorry about it. Ah, I heard something. Did someone follow me or something? What's happening? Oh, we have rain bolts. I don't know why the widgets are not working on the site. Sorry about it. Sorry. I'll try to figure that out. But rain bolt came in. Thank you. That's so kind of you. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, the philosopher Socrates and many of the most famous Greek ar uh, architects, sculptors, and painters. Okay, so... Point is, early high classical art was, you know, growing and it was a high point after this defeat of the Persians and stuff like that and they had a high point. So there's this, Cre gotta look it up, don't know how to say these Greek names. Critios. 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 Okay, Critios. So it's this Critios boy. The sculptures of the early classical period, circa 480 to 450 BCE, display a seriousness that contrasts sharply with the smiling figures of the archaic period. But a more fundamental and significant break from the archaic style was the rejection of the rigid and unnatural Egyptian-inspired pose of archaic statuary. Yay, it's going to get exciting now. The marble statue known as Critias Boy, figure 231, this one over here. Um, so named because scholars once thought it was the work of the sculptor Critias is... Um, he, it is the earliest manifestation of the new style. Never before had a sculptor been concerned with portraying how a human being, as opposed to a stone image, actually stands. Real people do not stand in the stiff-legged pose of the Koroi and uh, Korai or their Egyptian predecessors. Humans shift their weight and in the position of the, of the main body parts around the vertical, but flexible access of the spine. The Critias boy sculpture was among the first to grasp this fact and to represent it in statuary. The youth has a slight dip to the right hip, indicating the shift of weight onto his left leg. His right leg is bent at ease. The head also turns slightly to the right and tilts, breaking the unwritten rule of frontality being frontal and dictated uh, the form of virtually um, that dictated the form of all the earlier statues the weight shifts which art historians describe as contrapposto counterbalance separates classical from archaic greek statuary that's so cool and stunning so this was like one of the first times they found sculpture to be like tilting, shifting in weight and the head position and a bit more like human-like. I love it. That's what I'm all about. Again, we got a little degeneracy going on in here. Like, I mean, did he have to be naked? How degenerate. Okay, let me see what's happening over here. Um, materials and techniques. 
Hollow casting life size bronze statues. <gasps> cool. How exciting. Monumental bronze <clears throat> statues could not be manufactured using a simple, uh, single simple mold, as could small scale figures. Weight, cost, and the tendency of large masses of bronze to distort when cooling made life size casting in solid bronze impractical, if not impossible. Instead, sculptors hollow cast large statues by the um, Sarah Perdue lost wax method. The lost wax process entailed several steps and had to be repeated many times because bronze workers typically cast monumental statues like the Rias Warrior. Uh, race War. The Race Warrior. Oh my god. Look, it's the Race Warrior. Uh, in parts. So they did it in parts. The head, arms, hands, torso, and so forth. First, the sculptor fashioned a full-size clay model. <laughs> Jay loves it. Fuck, this thing gets hot. It's hot. I'm going to turn it off. I just touched it. It's really hot. Um, okay, so this guy, warrior from the sea of Rias. Rias? Let me see how to say that. From the race C. How to pronounce. Pronounce names dot com. Riace. 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 Okay, Riace. Uh Okay. Riace, Italy, circa 460 to 450 BCE. It's bronze and it's six feet, six inches high, this man. Um, it's in the Mu Ar Archaeological National Archaeology Museum in Calabria. Calabria. <laughs> Sounded Mexican. Well, I mean, you know. Why do they speak Spanish in Mexico? You know what I mean? Um, one of the few surviving classical bronze statues, the race warrior, has in inlaid eyes, silver teeth. What? Silver teeth? And eyelashes. Damn, cool. And copper lips and nipples. Oh, God. He's all gussied up. Um... The sculptor cast the various body parts in individual molds. But then, like, how do they make it, get that shit together and stuff? How do you just, like, put on copper nipples and silver eyelashes? It's insane. Just think that he didn't do the peen. No, no silver or copper peen. Just bronze. Oh my god, that's totally photoshopped out. That's ridiculous. Riace. <clears throat> okay, where are we at? Um, first, the sculpture fashioned. Fash? Fash? Race war? Fash? What is happening here? <laughs> first, the sculpture fashioned a full size clay model uh, of the intended statue, then a master mold. Uh, of clay. Oh, sorry, I was just like arranging how it looked down there. Uh, okay. So they made a mold of the sta uh, intended statue. The master mold of clay was formed around the model and removed in sections. When dry, the various pieces of master mold were then put back together for each separate body part. Next, a layer of beeswax was applied to the inside of each mold piece. When the wax cooled, the mold was removed and the sculpture was left with a hollow wax model in the shape of the original clay model. The artist could then correct or redefine refine details, for example, engraving fingernails on the hands or individual locks of hair on the head. In the next stage, a final clay mold, the investment, was applied to the exterior of the wax mold 
and a liquid clay core was poured inside the hollow wax. The bronze worker then drove metal pins, chaplets, through the new mold to connect the investment with the clay core. Okay. Uh, next, the wax was melted out, lost, and molten bronze poured into the mold in its place. When the bronze hardened and assumed the shape of the wax model, the sculptor removed the investment and much of the core as possible. Finally, artists fit together and soldered the individual individually cast pieces. Okay, so they soldered it together. Smothered surface uh, imperfections and joints, inlaid eyes and teeth and eyelashes provided attributes such as spears and wreaths and so forth. Okay. So these are the two stages of the lost wax method of bronze casting. Uh, drawing a show, drawing a shows, excuse me, drawing a shows a clay mold, the investment, okay. Wax model and clay core connected by chaplets, okay. So complicated. Drawing B shows the wax melted out Okay, and the molten bronze, bronze poured into form the cast bronze head. Oh my god, I never really realized how they did that. Huh. They're so crafty. So crafty. <clears throat> The race warrior. Okay, I think we do. We... The innovations of the courteous boy. Courteous boy, were carried even further in the bronze statue that we were just looking at of a warrior found in the sea near Reims, Italy. Uh, it is a pair of almost perfectly preserved statues discovered in a ship that sank in antiquity on its way from Greece, probably to Rome. The statue lacks only its shield, spear, and helmet. So he was naked with a spear and a helmet and a shield. Uh -huh. Go for it. Um, it is a masterpiece of hollow casting um, with inlaid eyes, silver teeth and eyelashes, and copper lips and nipples. The weight shift is more pronounced than the courteous boy. Um, the warrior's head more forcefully to the right, his shoulders tilt, um, his hips swing more markedly and his arms have been freed from the body. Natural motion in space has replaced archaic frontality and rigid, rigid, rigidity. Cool. What did I pronounce wrong? Shut up. I don't care. I tried. Um, okay. I'm just gonna call this Myron. And Disco Ballos. Myron and Disco Ballos. That's how I'm gonna. <laughs> Jay. <laughs> um. Okay. The Chris. Uh, Critoius, Critius boy, and the race warrior stand at rest, but early classical, classical Greek sculptures also explored how to represent figures engaged in various action. The famous Disco Ballos, discus thrower by Myron, uh, figure 2-1, with his arms boldly extended, body twisted, and left heel raised off the ground such as uh, a statue is such a statue excuse me is such this right here is such a statue is this it yeah. no this is not disco ballos where's disco ballos oh yeah 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 okay the discus throw was like in the beginning right here okay what page are we on 66 this this guy 
<laughs> the disco ball of sky. Disco ball. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Okay. Shit. Now where am I? <clears throat> The post suggests the motion of a pendulum clock. The athlete's right arm has reached the apex of its arc, but has not yet begun to swing down again. Myron froze the action and arranged the body and limbs to form two intersecting arcs, creating the impression of a tightly uh, stretched bow a, mo uh, a moment before the string is released. <clears throat> um, the illustrated marble statue, however, is not Myron's, which was bronze. It is a copy made in Roman times. Roman <clears throat> demand for famous Greek statues so far exceeded the supply that it spawned a variety, uh, ver verita veritable industry to meet the Roman uh, call for copies to display it in both public and private venues. The sculptors usually made the copies in less costly marble, and the change in medium resulted in a different surface appearance. In most cases, the copyist also had to add an intuitive tree trunk uh, to support the great weight of the stone statue uh, and insert struts between arms and body to strengthen weak joints. The copies rarely approach the quality of the originals, obviously, but they are uh, indispensable today. Without them, it would be impossible to reconstruct the history of Greek sculpture after the Archaic period. Damn, so this copycat's used a purpose, I guess. Served a purpose. Um, I have to look up how to say this shit, sorry. Polyclitus. 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 Dari Foros. Dari Foros. Dari Foros. Dari Foros. Dari Foros and Polyclitos. Polyclitos and Dari Foros. One of the most frequent copied Greek statues was the Dari Foros spear bearer, figure 234. And this guy. Highly copied um, by Polyclitos, a work that epitomizes the intellectual rigor of high classical statuary design. <gasps> Oh my god, I love it. It epitomizes the intellectual rigor of high classical statuary design. The Dori Foros is the culmination of the evolution in Greek statuary from the archaic Kuros to the Kratoris boy to the Reyes warrior. The Contra Pasto is more pronounced than ever before in a standing statue. But Polyclitos was not content with simply rendering a figure that stands naturally. His aim was to impose order on human movement, to make it beautiful, to perfect it. He achieved this through a system of cross-balance of the figure's various parts. Just want to stop for a second and appreciate that for a second. He was not just interested in mimicking human form. He was looking for beauty and perfection okay that's it people that's it that's where we're at right now why we talk about this stuff um polyclitos check it on you guys um okay so
perfect it. He achieved this through a system of cross-balance of the figure's various parts. Note, for instance, how the straight hanging arm echoes the rigid supporting leg. Yes. Yes, that's very lovely. Um, providing the figure's right side with the um, columnar, columnar stability needed to anchor the left's side dynamically flexed limbs. This tensed and relaxed limb oppose each other diagonally. The right arm and the left leg are relaxed and the tensed supporting leg opposes the flexed arm which held a spear. Uh, in, the, um, in like manner, the head turns to the right while the hips twist slightly to the left. Although the Darifora seemed to take a step forward, he does not move. This dynamic, uh, asymmetrical balance, this motion while at rest, the resulting harmony of opposites are the essence of the polyclitan style. Oh, I love that. Um, I love it, I love it. Um, that's also something that I love. Oh my god, this kitty. Uh, that's something that I love too. I love asymmetry. I love balancing you know, and in dance ballet, there's always like a way that you tilt your head when you do work pour de bras or whatever, and you hold your, you know, the way that you do it. And um, that's why sometimes I get into trouble with things like my avatar and stuff like that on Twitter. People like freak out sometimes because I have like one eye covered and they like call me like Illuminati or something. And I'm just like, dude, asymmetry, man, get with it. It's artsy. Asymmetry. Um, where are we at? Okay. Polyclitos made the difor diphoros. Um, okay. Sorry. Polyclitos made the diphoros as a demonstration piece to accompany his treatise on the ideal statue of a nude man. <gasps> Ew, cool. I'll copy that. Copying it. Tweeting about it. Okay, cool. Sorry. Um... Pilocritus made the Diphoros as a demonstration piece to accompany his treatise on the ideal statue of a nude man. Spear Bearer is but a modern uh, descriptive name for the work. The title the artist assigned to the statue was Canon. Polyclitos was greatly influenced by the philosopher Pythagoras of Samos, who lived during the latter part of the 6th century BCE. A famous geometric theorem still bears his name, Pythagoras. Art and math connection. I'm just gonna screen cap this art math connection real quick. Okay. Um, mm, mm, okay. Famous geometric theorem still bears his name today. Pythagoras also discovered that harmonic chords in music are produced on the strings of a lyre at regular intervals that may be expressed as ratios of whole numbers: two to one, three to two, four to three. He and his followers, the Pythagoreans believed more generally that underlining uh, harmonic proportions could be found in all of nature, determining the form of the cosmos as well as of things on earth, and that beauty resided in har harmonious numerical ratios. By this reasoning, a perfect statue would be uh, one constructed according to an all-encompassing mathematical formula, and that is what Polyclitos achieved in his Diphoros. Uh, Galen, a physician who lived during the second century CE, summarized Polyclitus's philosophy as follows. Sorry, I just want to copy that. It's beautiful. Um, he and his um, followers, yeah, okay, so summarized Polyclitus's philosophy as follows. Beauty arises from the um, commensurability symmetry, symmetry 
of the parts. Okay, so yeah, I think symmetry of the parts, such as that of finger to finger and of all the fingers to the palm and the wrist and of these to the forearm and of the forearm to the upper arm and in fact of everything to everything else just as it is written in the canon of Polycleitos. Polycleitos supported his treaties by making a statue according to the tenets of his treaties uh, and called the statue like the work the canon. Okay, this is why uh, Pliny and Elger, the uh, writing in the first century CE, CE maintained that Pliny, Polycleitos alone of men is deemed to have rendered art itself, that is, the historical basis of art in a work of art. Damn, this is the epitome of the Western art that we talk about all the time. Cool. I dig. I dig. How are you guys doing? Okay, we got 18 people in here, I think. And we've been on for an hour and 11 minutes. So I'm going to take a little break. Um, you know, you guys can think about what we just went over. All of this Greek sculpture stuff and the high classical art before we move on to some of the architecture of the, the high period like the um, Parthenon and stuff like that but yeah that's pretty cool that's pretty cool so I'll just put on a commercial for a few minutes you guys chill listen to the cool music we'll be back to discuss some more history in a few minutes okay bye
Every morning I wake up and open palm slam a VHS into the slot. It is Chronicles of Riddick, 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 Riddick. Chronicles of Riddick. Every morning I wake up and open palm slam a VHS into the slot. It is Chronicles of Riddick. 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 Chronicles of Riddick. And right then and there I start doing the moves alongside with the main character, Riddick. 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 And right then and there I start doing the moves alongside with the main character. Riddick, 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 I do every move and I do every move hard. Making whoosh and sounds when I slam down some necro bastards or even when I mess up technique. Not many can say they escaped the galaxy's most dangerous prison. I can't. Unfortunately, I had to go to the bathroom real bad, and there's someone taking a shower, so I didn't get to go. So yeah, that really sucks. I might have to just like dip out for like two seconds when they're out of the shower, but it is what it is. <clears throat> Let's see. I guess we'll just continue a little bit until I can hear that it's free. Um, <clears throat> so we have the Athenian Acropolis while Polyclitos was working out his, um, let me just see that a little bit. Great, now I think they're out of the bathroom. I'll give it a minute. While Polyclotus was working out his prescription for the perfect statue, the Athenians, under the leadership of um, Pericles, oh, no, let's make sure if we're talking about him, I'm saying that right. Sorry. <clears throat> Pericles. Pericles. All right, so we got Pericles. Um, <clears throat> while Polyclotus was working out the perfect prescription uh, for the perfect statue, uh, the Athenians, under the leadership of Pericles, were initiating one of history's most ambitious building projects, the reconstruction of the Acropolis. Acropolis means high city. After the Persian sack. Um, in Fort... 478 BCE, in the aftermath of the Persian defeat 
uh, the Greeks formed an alliance for mutual protection against any renew, uh, renewed threat from the east. The new confederacy became known as the Del Del Delian League. Delian League. Delian. Delian. Okay. The new confederacy became known as the Delian League because its headquarters were on the um, Cycladic island of Delos. Although at the outset each league member had an equal vote, Athens was first among equals, providing the allied fleet commander and determining which cities were to furnish ships uh, and which were instead to pay an annual tribute to the treasury at Delos. Continued fighting against the Persians kept the alliance intact, but Athens gradually assumed a dominant role. In 454 BCE, the Athenians transferred the Delian treasury to Athens, um, ostensibly for security reasons. League members continued to pay tribute, but um, Pericles did not uh, expend the surplus reserves for the common good of the allied Greek states. Instead, he expropriated the funds to resurrect the Acropolis, 235. <clears throat> Thus, the Perclean, 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 Perclean um, building program was not the glorious fruit of Athenian democracy as commonly thought, but the byproduct of tyranny and the abuse of power. Too often, art and architectural historians do not ask how monuments were financed, uh, how a monument was financed. The answer can be very re uh, revealing. The centerpiece of the Perclean Acropolis was the Parthenon, the temple of Athena Par Parthenon, Parthenos, erected in the remarkably short period between 447 and 438 BCE. Work on the great temple's ambitious sculpture ornamentation continued until 432 BCE. Immediately upon completion of the Parthenon, construction commenced on a grand new gateway to the Acropolis, the Pro Proplia. Uh, two later temples, the Erechtheion and the Temple of Athena, Nike, built after um, Pericles' death, were probably also part of uh, his grand plan. <clears throat> and this is the restored view of the Acropolis in Athens, Greece. Uh, number one is the Parthenon. Okay, so it's the thing with all the columns. The Propylia that we mentioned, number two. Okay, that's like the entrance above the stairs. The Ecrithion. Uh, all right, that thing next to the stairs. Temple of Athena Nike is over there, hanging to the left. Under Pericles, the Athenians undertook one of history's most ambitious building projects, the reconstruction of the Acropolis after the Persian sack. The funds came from the Dillian League treasury. <clears throat> Just checking in on you guys. Okay. Parthenon architecture. Most of the um, peripheral colonnade of the wait parapetral. Hmm. Let me see. Hold on. Let me see. Let me see. Peripteral. Peripteral. Having a single row of pillars on all sides uh, in the style of the temples of ancient Greece. Okay, most of the peripteral colonnade of the Parthenon, figure 236, this thing here, still stands or has been uh, re-erected. And art historians know a great deal about the building and its sculptural program. The architects were Ictinos and Cali Calicrates, uh, Calicrates, 
Uh, the statue of Athena was the work of Phidias, who was also the overseer of the temple sculptural decoration. In fact, uh, Plutarch, who wrote a biography of uh, Pericles in the early 2nd century CE, claims that Phidias was in charge of the entire Periclean building program, just as the contemporaneous Diaphoros is the culmination of nearly two centuries of searching for the ideal proportion of the human body, so too by the Parthenon. Oh my god. Is that cat here? I think this is a cat man to be let out. And I could use the bathroom. Hold on a second, guys. I'll be right back. No bathroom not ready. <laughs> um, okay, where are we? Um, okay, so just as Diaphoros is a culmination of nearly two centuries of searching for the ideal propor proportions of the human body, so too the Parthenon may be viewed as the ideal solution to the Greek architect's quest for per perfect proportions in Doric temple design. The Parthenon architects and uh, Polycleitos were kindred spirits in their belief that strict adherence to harmonious numeral numerological numer numerical ratios produced ideal forms. For the Parthenon, the controlling ratio for the symmetria symmetry of the parts may be expressed algebraically as x equals two y plus one. That just immediately makes me want to solve for y. Um, yeah, that needs to be a y. A y equals, thus for example, the temple's short ends have eight columns and the long side have 17 because 17 equals two times uh, eight plus one. Um, the Stylobates ratio of length to width is 9 to 4 because 9 equals 2 times 4 plus 1 and so forth throughout, throughout the temple. The Parthenon's harmonious design and uh, the mathematical precision of the sizes of its uh, constituent elements obscure the fact that the architects incorporated in their design pronounced deviations from the strictly horizontal and vertical lines assumed to be the basis of all Greek temples. The stylobate, for example, curves upwards at the center of all four sides, forming a kind of shallow dome. And this curvature is carried up into the entablature. Moreover, the peristyle columns lean inward slightly. Those at the corners have a diagonal inclination and are also about two inches thicker than the rest. If their lines continued, they would meet at about 1.5 miles above the temple. This deviation, uh, these deviations from the norm meant that the Athenian masons had to carve virtually every Parthenon block according to the special set specific specifications dictated <clears throat> by its unique place in the structure. So all of them are like absolutely unique places that fit exactly because everything's slightly off um, for a reason and it's like all precise. Um, the deviations from the norm meant that the Athenian, Mason, the Athenian Masons had to carve out virtually every Parthenon block according to the special set of specifications dictated by its unique place in the structure. Vitruvius, a Roman architect of the late 1st century BCE, explains these adjustments as compensations for optical illusions. That's what I was saying earlier when we were bringing up the Greek um, columns, and then, uh, not the Greek, the Egyptian columns, and like, there's just, we've been noticing, like, the columns... There's different things about them all the time. Oh my god, this cat. Hold on a second. <clears throat> anyway, okay, so yeah, um, 
I think that I remember that it's like something about the columns also being kind of like concave, like getting smaller, I think, as it goes up, um, creates an optical illusion of like grandeur and stuff. Anyway, so according to Vitruvius, if a stalobite is laid out on level surface, wait, wait. Yeah, for optical illusions. According to Vitruvius, if a stylobite is laid out on a level surface, it will, it will appear to sag at the center. He also said that the corner columns of a building should be thicker because they are surrounded by light and would otherwise appear thinner than their, near, uh, than their neighbors. One of the ironies of the Parthenon, the world's most famous Doric temple, is that it is um, contaminated by ionic elements. Uh, let's see, 237, let me see, okay, they have this plan, the 237. Although the Stella had two, had a two-story Doric colonnade around, um, Phidias's Athena, the back room, which housed the goddess's treasury and the tribute collected from the Dillian League, had four tall and slender ionic columns, uh, as sole supporters for the superstructure. <clears throat> Oops. And whereas the temple's exterior had a Doric frieze, the inner frieze uh, that ran around the top of the cello was, wall was ionic. Perhaps this fusion of Doric and Ionic elements reflected the Athenians' belief that the Ionians of the Clicclactic islands and Asia Minor descended from Athenian settlers and were therefore their kin. Or it may be um, uh, Pericles's and Ictinos's way of suggesting that Athens was the leader of all the Greeks. In any case, a mix of Doric and Ionic features characterizes the 5th century BCE buildings of the Acropolis as a whole. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just feeling like I'm hoping that my lymph nodes aren't as small. And I'm just really paranoid about like cancer and shit. Match my little sister. <clears throat> I hope I'm not getting sick. My sister's gonna freak if I get sick. I hope I don't have coronavirus. <clears throat> Hmm. Anyway. Okay, so... The Parthenon was more lavishly decorated than any Greek temple before it. Um, the Athena Parth Parthenos. Um... Okay, so the Parthenon was more lavishly decorated than any Greek temple before it, Doric or Ionic. Every one of the 92 Doric met, uh, met, metopes was decorated with relief sculpture. Um, so too was every inch of the 524 foot long Ionic friezes. Dozens of larger than life size statues were set in the two pediments. The director of the, this vast sculptural program was Phidias though he himself executed only the Athena Parth Parthenos, the statue of Athena and uh, Athena the Virgin, which stood in the Parthenon cella. It was a chrysalidine statue that is fashioned of gold and ivory and stood 38 feet tall. Cool. Athena was fully armed with shield, spear, and helmets, and she held Nike, the winged female personification of victory in her extended right hand. No one doubts that this is Nike referred to the victory of, uh, that this Nike referred to the victory of 479 BCE. The memory of the Persian sack of the Acropolis was still vivid and the Athenians were intensely conscious that by driving, uh, intensely conscious that by driving back the Persians, they were saving their civilization from the East, Eastern barbarians who had committed atrocities against the Greeks of Asia Minor. Wow. I mean, that really tells you something. They had no shame in nationalism back then because they understood that's what protected them from outsiders. Um, and look at that. 
They're, when their civilization is doing great, look at the art and culture that prospers. And we still study today. Um, mm -mm. In fact, the Athena Parthenos uh, had multiple allus uh, allusions to the Persian defeat. On the thick soles of Athena's sandals was a representation of a centauromachy, a battle between Greeks and cent centaurs, mythological beasts that were part man, part horse. Emblazoned on the exterior of her shield were high relief uh, reliefs depicting the battle of Greeks and Amazons. Wait, wait, hold up. So inside of that thing is what they're telling me? Oh, oh no, no, in inside of the actual thing is her sculpture. Right, right, right. Okay. And on her shield, there was like a battle. Uh -huh. Got it. Okay. Crazy. The, um, let me see what's happening here. Multiple illusions. So it was on her shield. We're high relief depicting the Greeks, uh, battle of Greeks and Amazons in which, uh, Theseus drove the Amazon's female warriors out of Athens. Phidias also painted a gigantomachy on the shield's interior. Each of these mythological concepts was a metaphor for the triumph over chaos. Coas of civilization over barbarianism and of Athens over Persia. Yeah, so basically the Greeks were like, fuck oh, yeah. We won this battle. We didn't forget about it. We're keeping an eye on you fuckers. You come here, we'll destroy you. Plan of the Parthenon Acropolis, Athens, Greece, with diagram of sculptural program, 447 to 432 BCE. The Parthenon was lavishly decorated. Statues filled both pediments and reliefs adorned uh, all 92 Doric metopes, as well as the 524-foot Ionic friezes in the cella was... Phidias's colossal gold and ivory Athena. Wow. <clears throat> Let's see where we're at. Yeah. Okay, we're still going through some of the golden age here. All right. Coloss. Oh, guys. Oh my God. Wait. Oh my god, I totally fucked this up. So, yeah, my bad. If you're watching this on D Live and you do this Streamlabs, it does go on today. That's right, because it's live right now. But if you're watching this on YouTube and you do Streamlabs, then you'll see it show up in the next stream. That's how that works. Shit, I fucked that up earlier. Oh well. Anyway, how are you guys doing? Um, you all right? Awfully quiet on D Live. Awfully quiet. Kawas. All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> Where are we at? Okay, so we have Parthenon. Okay, let's see if I've been saying this right the whole time or not. Metopes. Metopes. Been saying it wrong the whole time. Me Metopes. Metopes. Parthenon. These uh, same themes appeared again in the Parthenon's Doric Metopes. Metopes. <clears throat> Let me see, figure 237. Okay, so yeah, in the Parthenon is this Metopes. Oh, the same theme appeared. Okay, the South Metopes are the best preserved. They depict the battle of uh, Lapiths and Centaurs, a combat in which... Um, Theseus of Athens played a major role 
on one extraordinary slab, figure 238. Okay, so this one to the left. Let me make sure you guys see it. Yeah, you see it pretty good. Um, this thing to the left here. <clears throat> oh my god, I hope I don't get coronavirus. A triumphant centaur rises up on its hind legs, exalting over the crumbled body of the Greek it has defeated. The relief is so high that parts are fully in the round. Whoa, cool. Yeah, so it is technically a relief, but it's like, um, it's quite high that it's like pops right out too. And some pieces have broken off. The sculptor knew how to distinguish the vibrant, powerful form of the living beast from the lifeless corpse on the ground. Uh, in other metopes, the Greeks have the upper hand, but the full set suggests that the battle was a difficult one against a dangerous enemy and that losses as well as victories occurred. The same was true of the war against the Persians. Okay. Um, Parthenon pediments. The subjects of the two pediments were especially appropriate. Let me just zoom in a little bit. <clears throat> were especially appropriate for a temple that celebrated the Athenians as well as the goddess Athena. The east pediment depicted the birth of Athena. Oh, and uh, at the west, oh, oh my. I think that was fuck Google too. Okay, five bucks. He said, "Do you miss British tea?" I do. I do. We have some British tea here, and I also brought some of that. Um, what is it called? That uh, you know, stuff from the airport, like gift, gift shit. But it's like tea in it, of course, because it's British. But and the tea's really good. It's like essence of bergamot in it and everything. But yeah, just the same, the simple black tea we can have. But it's like. No one really does it as much. It's kind of like an oddity. It's like, oh, tea. Hmm, how cute. Let's have tea today. I'm like, I don't know. My family, we are used to having tea, but um, we haven't been doing that at my sister's house lately. So, Or when I go hang out with other people. I mean, not that I hang out with other people right now because coronavirus. Coas. Okay, so let's see. The east pediment depicted the birth of Athena. At the west was the contest between Athea and Poseidon to determine which one would become the city's patron deity. Athena won, giving her name to the city and its people. Significantly in both the story and the pediment, the Athenians are judges of the relative merits of the two gods. The relative merits of the two gods. This reflects the same arrogance that led to the use of Dillian uh, League funds to adorn the Acropolis. All that remains of the East Pediment statues are the uh, sp spectators to the left and uh, the right who witnessed Athena's birth on Mount Olympus. I'm trying to see it. So, okay, I think that's... It's not that. So. Athena's birth on Mount Olympus. At the, uh, Olympus. Uh, the far left are the head and arms of Helios, the sun, uh, and his chariot horses rising from the pediment floor. Figure 239. Okay, so 239. So... Helios, the sun, and his chariot. That's like all that's left of it, I guess. Next to them is a powerful male figure, usually identified as Dionysus, Dionysus or possibly Hercules, who entered the realm of the gods after he completed 12 impossible labors. At the right are three. It's interesting because they... Um, so see, I've done a video on my YouTube before about this giant 
Dionysus, Dionysus uh, head. I'm not sure actually if I posted it or not, but I did film a video about uh, a new discovery of a giant head uh, in Greece, Greece somewhere, um, this past year. And I was looking into things and trying to show more like um, culture and history and information about these findings. And I did come up with something about how Dionysus, Dionysus was often um, used to represent also Jesus. Because <clears throat> especially when like you weren't allowed to be like Christian or whatever in that time, they kind of like, there's like an overlap where they started using these like figures to represent like figures they actually wanted to worship. And so there's a lot of similarities with, with Jesus. And it's interesting because they mentioned 12. Um, 12 impossible labors, the 12 um, apostles. Um, at the right are three uh, goddesses, probably Hestia, Dione, and Aphrodite. And then either Selene. Love that. That's gorgeous. Gorgeous! Female forms with fabric. I just love it. That's what alchemy is all about. Mm. I think I'm getting a sore throat. My sister's going to fucking... <clears throat> um, okay, and then either then either Celine Moon or Nyx Knight and more horses, this time uh, sinking below the pediment floor. <clears throat> Here, Phidias discovers an entirely new way to deal with the awkward triangular frame of the pediment. Its bottom line is the horizon line, and um, <clears throat> charioteer, charioteers and their horses move through through it effortlessly. I want to see it. I don't think I can see it. They're just describing it to us. <clears throat> the dais and his assistants. Uh, were master sculptors. They fully understood not only the surface appearance of anatomy, uh, human anatomy, both male and female, but also the mechanics of how muscles and bones make the body move. They mastered the uh, rendition of clothed forms, too. Uh, sorry, I was just thinking about being sick. I can't even read. I might just get off this thing. I hope I'm not sick. My throat's kind of killing me now. But that's not a sign of coronavirus, but still... I can't get weak now when there is coronavirus. It's not a time to get sick. I haven't been sick in years. I don't remember last time I was sick. Oh. <clears throat> all right, I'll just finish up this thing. Um, all right, so yeah, Fadias and his assistants were master sculptors. Uh, they understood, like anatomy, male and female, the mechanics of how muscles and bones move uh, the body. They mastered the rendition of clothed, clothed forms as well in the um, Dion Aphrodite group. This thing up here. Oh yeah, let's read that. The three goddesses, Hestia, Dion, and Aphrodite from the east uh, pediment of the Parthenon, Acropolis, Athens, Greece, circa 438 to 432 BCE. It's made out of marble. Greatest height is four feet, five inches. It's in the British Museum, London. Oh, I wish I got to see that. The statues of Hestia, Dion, and Aphrodite conform perfectly to the sloping right side of the Parthenon's east pediment. The thin and heavy folds of the garment alternately reveal and conceal the body forms. That's all I love about Lady Alchemy, hiding and concealing and showing body forms, fabric. Ah, gorgeous. Love it. Um, love it, love it. <clears throat> okay, um... In the Dion Aphrodite group, the thin and heavy folds of the garments all alternately reveal and conceal the main and lesser body masses while swirling in a compositional tide that subtly unifies the figures. I love that. The articulation and integration of the bodies produce a wonderful variation of surface and play of light and shade. That's true. Moreover, all the figures, even the animals, are brilliantly characterized. The horses of the sun at the beginning of the day are energetic. Those of the moon or night have labored until dawn are weary. 
stunning, stunning, stunning. All right, that's where we're going to leave off for today. And probably just got in here, but I think that's where we are going to leave that off. Oh my god, I just saw a still of me making a freaked out face. Um, anyway. If you guys have any questions or concerns, if you're on DLive, I can answer them on video right here. If you are watching on YouTube, then I'm probably in the chats. So I can answer your questions there. Yeah, let me know how you guys are doing. Did you enjoy that today? No, all right, guys. No one's saying anything, no one's interacting, so I may as well get a book out of here. But we'll end it with that. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And we will continue with this classical high Greek art shit uh, next art stream. Okay. Bye. Bye.